barns. They are interesting structures, but they can hold many secrets and sometimes dark mysteries too. Bible Sleuth here, and today we are digging into another mystery from Jesus' parables. Let's head over to the scene, which still seems to be up on a mountain plain, in Luke 12, in the KJV, of course. And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother, that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? And he said unto them, Take heed, and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possess. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. Well, there it is, the parable of the unwise farmer, and what preempted Jesus to tell it. There are always questions. And one particular question is, why did this person in the crowd just randomly blurt out this request? Next, what's wrong with pulling down a barn and building a bigger barn to store you the abundance. Also, why did Jesus have the rich man talking to his soul? That last question may seem kind of odd for some reading the modern language versions. I have been using the King James Version of the Bible strictly for copyright reasons. However, in modern translations, the landowner was talking to himself. But the word used in the KJV seems to indicate something more, which might explain why Jesus had him talking to his own soul. Let's go find the man in the crowd and ask him a few questions. For one, why did he do this? I discovered that in Jesus' day, the eldest son would get a double portion of his father's estate upon passing, and the rest was divided probably by him, to the younger children. So one can assume that this guy in the crowd was feeling cheated, possibly being the youngest sibling. I guess too that he considered Jesus a rabbi or religious leader to have asked that question because in such matters, the leaders of the day would step in and act as arbitrary. Exodus 18, 13 through 23 describes how initially Moses served as an arbitrator for the people. However, at the advice of his father-in-law, Jethro, he picked leaders in the assembly and taught them the decrees. Look at Exodus 18, 21. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands and rulers of the hundreds and rulers of fifties and rulers of tens. These positions were appointed because of their attributes and their character. But by Jesus' time, we see a different picture. In an article I read by Doug Reed, I quote, the priest at the temple in Jerusalem not only officiated over the religious life of the Jews, they were also rulers and judges. These folks were pawns of the Roman Empire and benefited greatly as a means of maintaining order. In fact, archaeological finds suggest these people lived in lavish, ornate mansions. Compare that to the same people who lumped tax collectors in with sinners. Check out the cloth in the wine case. It is the essence of hypocrisy. 
Anyway, it is likely the man saw Jesus as a teacher of the law, thus holding a judicial authority. He may have been willing to pay Jesus. Now, doesn't this sound a little fishy? Maybe that was one of the reasons that led to the rebuke in Jesus' response. Ultimately, Jesus is the supreme judge. However, he didn't claim that, saying, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? Jesus was on a mission and would not be diverted. He zeroed down then on the real problem, judging rightly as he always did and always does, the request being made out of covetousness. For the second question, we should visit the man in the parable. You see, his barns were already full, having been given plenty for many seasons, which is critical to the story. He had stored up, not used up, or shared what the soil had produced. I also find it interesting that Jesus differentiated between the soil and the landowner in the parable. Maybe what is not said becomes the obvious. The plenty actually came from God. What is done with the plenty is what is important. In this case, he was hoarding it rather than being generous to the poor with what was given. The true wealth of the kingdom. The problem begins in verse 17 with the rich farmer. And he thought to himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. This is where the confusion took place. Could it be that what God gives, he places an expiration date? Paul wrote to Timothy about his upcoming death, saying, For I am steadily being poured out like a drink offering. He actually said something similar in Philippians. The notion is that we stay full of God in his word and in consistent prayer as we pour out our lives for those around us. This was Paul's position in his ministry as it was with all the apostles and represents wealth toward God. This reminded me of another parable that Jesus told about ten virgins. Five wives who kept their wicks trimmed and their lamps full of oil as they awaited the coming bridegroom. However, there were five foolish who were not prepared and in the end were locked out of the wedding. The oil is representative of the Holy Spirit, which we are to be continually seeking to fill our lives. Yet we are not hoarding the oil. Rather, we are to be poured out as a drink offering. More about that parable in a later episode. The man talking to his own soul reminded me of Eve in Genesis 3. When she was tempted by the serpent, in verse 6 it says, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit. The similarity? Both the man in the parable and Eve's downfall began within their thought processes. In both cases, the land was fruitful, and in both cases, wisdom was related. In the case of the Hebrew word used for make wise in Genesis, one of the words used for the meaning of the word means to prosper. So was covetousness part of the original sin? Look what Proverbs 24, 1 through 4 says about wisdom. Be not thou envious against evil men, neither desire to be with them, for their heart studieth destruction, and their lips talk of mischief. Through wisdom is a house builded, and by understanding it is established, and by knowledge shall the chambers be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Now that doesn't sound much different, right? However, the word used for riches can also mean enough or sufficient. It is important to learn to be content with what God gives. It's just too easy to look around and begin to compare. Seeking the kingdom of God means to fix one's gaze on God and him alone. It is interesting that the man is talking to his own soul as if he's the master of it in the KJV. Soul Thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Wait a minute. 
Does this sound familiar? In Matthew 24, 37 through 39, Jesus is explaining what the end times will look like. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. Maybe that is a side product of covetous gain, feeling like you're the master of your own destiny and soul. In God's kingdom, we need to relinquish our control to him. A quick search on the internet, and it's easy to find people that feel they need to be the master. This is why we have phrases such as self-made person. The world idolizes these folks books, listen to their speeches and unfortunately sermons, and follow them on social mediums because they have the key to the good life. The question, how many seasons did it take for God's soil to fill their barns? Could God be close to saying what he said to the rich fool? Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Remember, it was the soil and ultimately God that actually provided the abundance. King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon walked down this road and it did not fare well for him. In Daniel 4, it tells a crazy story of how Nebuchadnezzar was driven out of his kingdom and lived like an animal, even eating grass because he took credit for the greatness of his kingdom. He was even warned in advance. The warning in the parable was where it stopped for the crowd, but Jesus had more to say to the disciples. Luke 12, 22 through 32 says, I say unto you, take no thought for your life what ye shall eat, neither for the body what ye shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? And which of you, with taking thought, can add to his stature one cubit? If ye then not be able to do that thing which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. Yet I say unto you that Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If God so clothe the grass, which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? And seek not ye what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, neither be ye doubtful of mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. But rather, seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. I'm struck with a couple things found in verse 22 and 23. First it says, take no thought for your life in verse 22. And then it says, the life is more than food and clothes in verse 23. So he went from your life to the life. Is there a difference? It seems that the world is seeking after fine foods, clothes, and filling up metaphorical barns and storehouses and retiring with ease, as found in verse 30. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knoweth that you have need of these things. Look what Paul says in Philippians 4.11. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Prosperity isn't a large bank account or a full house of all that is desired. It's seeking the kingdom of God and knowing his grace is sufficient. The key to the life, I believe, is found in verse 31. But rather, seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Here's a thought. Try seeking God's kingdom to come into your family, in your job, and in all your activities.